So we've talked about a number of solid media, but liquid media is also frequently used in the diagnostic lab. And we might employ these media when we have samples that are not easily plated onto solid media, when we have large sample volumes, or in many research applications, such as culturing organisms from food. What you can see in this picture is a dried snake, which we were culturing for research purposes to identify antimicrobial resistant organisms. The dried snake was very uh, uh, sharp and, and pointy. And so if we were to try and uh, plate that directly onto agar, it would have scratched up our plate. By washing it in this buffered peptone water, we're able to rinse bacteria off of its surface, which we can then, in a much more non-destructive way, apply to our solid media. We can also use broths for enrichment culture. Here you can see bottles of McConkey broth for the selective enrichment of Escherichia coli. So once we have an organism in pure culture, we have our isolate, it needs to be identified. So how do we do that? How do we actually determine what species we're dealing with? Well, there's a few methods that can be used. One is the classical set of biochemical tests. Another is to use matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization time of flight, which is abbreviated MALDI-TOF, and has rapidly become the method of choice for bacterial identification in diagnostic labs. And then finally, we could do some sort of nucleic acid amplification test. So a polymerase chain reaction or PCR, real-time PCR, or probe-based assay. And I'm not going to talk about any of those uh, in more detail in this lecture. So first, biochemical tests. These are phenotypic assays, which oftentimes rely on some sort of color change of our media, on agglutination of the media, or change in consistency to differentiate a positive test from a negative test. In the left image here, you can see the indole tube test. On the left tube, we have a negative, so there's no color change from uninoculated. On the right, we have this bright pink positive reaction indicating a, an indole positive organism. In the center here, we have the Lansfield group test kit for streptococcus species. Here, what we're looking for is an agglutination reaction. We have these antisera, um, which are able to agglutinate different surface antigens on streptococci, leading to clumping that we can visualize on these cards. And then finally, on the far right here, we have an example of the coagulase test. So in this assay, we have some rabbit plasma that we inoculate with uh, different staphylococcus species. And what we're looking for is clot formation. So on the left, we have an uninoculated tube. You can see there's no clot when that tube is tilted on its side. In the center, we have a coagulase negative species, which looks very similar to our uninoculated. And then on the right, this one formed a clot at the bottom of the tube, which when the tube is tilted, you can see it doesn't run up the side. Once we've done all our biochemical tests, we have to interpret them. And in order to do this, we commonly use these biochemical identification tables that you can find in any good diagnostic microbiology textbook. So there's lists of tests along the top here, all of our different species along the y-axis, and then the percentage of isolates of each species that are supposed to be positive for each test um, listed within the table. So it's a very uh, time-consuming method of identifying organisms, and it's really started to go out of favor with the introduction of Malditoff. So Malditoff is oftentimes treated as kind of an answer box. Um, it's, it performs very well for most routine identifications, and it has some huge advantages over classical biochemical tests. It's very fast. It allows us to identify an organism from primary culture. So we can take just a single isolated colony, and that provides us with enough material to get uh, a species level identification. So we don't need another overnight incubation. This improves turnaround time and the quality of service that a lab is uh, able to provide. And it's also inexpensive, at least in terms of the reagent costs. There's no need to maintain a large inventory of biochemical tests. 
Having said that, the equipment costs are very high. So this machine over here is several hundred thousand dollars. So it's very inexpensive to operate, but you need a large capital investment. I've put a link to a video up here where you can see a demonstration of just how useful Malditoff can be in a diagnostic setting. Next, we're going to talk about biocontainment levels. So in Canada, we actually use a different system than in the United States, where we discuss organism biocontainment level as opposed to risk group. What differentiates this system is that what we're considering are the facilities, procedures, and equipment that's required to handle these organisms safely. Now, most of the time, the levels entirely overlap. So a level one organism in Canada is a level one organism in the US. But the information that goes into this designation is not exactly the same. If you're interested in looking up what risk group uh, a given organism might be, I would suggest taking a look at ePathogen. This is a database run by the Public Health Agency of Canada, and it's a really useful resource. Uh, when considering biosafety and biocontainment levels. So just like the American system, we have levels one to four. Level one are organisms which can be worked with in a well-functioning laboratory. Level two, these are agents which, in order to become infected, require either ingestion or inoculation. Um, basic personal protective equipment, things like lab coats, and primary containment devices, such as biosafety cabinets, are required in these laboratories. Biocontainment level three are organisms which may be airborne, and in order to work with them safely, we require additional primary and secondary barriers, so things like respirators and HEPA-filtered lab exhaust. And then finally, biocontainment level four, these are organisms for which maximum precautions are required. So complete isolation of the facility, decontamination of all laboratory effluents, and those positive pressure spacesuits. Biological risk groups, on the other hand, considers factors related to the infection itself. So do we have preventive measures available, things like vaccinations, effective treatments, antibiotics, how pathogenic is the organism? Does it tend to cause mild infections or very serious life-threatening infections? What's the infectious dose? Do you have to drink an entire vial of a culture or is a single organism enough to make you sick? What's the mode of transmission? Would you have to actually ingest the organism or is it airborne? And then what's the host range? Does it infect only people or can it be found in many species? Another way that we think about risk groups is in terms of who is potentially put at risk if there was to be an exposure. So risk group one would be considered a low risk for both the individual and the community more broadly. Risk group two could have moderate risks or moderate implications for the individual, but generally speaking, quite a low risk for the community. Risk group three would be a high risk for the individual, but a low risk for the community and risk group four would be a high risk all around. So what are some organisms that might uh, fall into each of these biocontainment levels? So level one, these are, are bugs that are unlikely to cause disease in otherwise healthy individuals. You may encounter infections with such organisms in immunosuppressed individuals, and examples might include things like environmental organisms, so mold, soil bacteria, things like that, laboratory strains that are used as experimental controls, plasmid recipients, or reference isolates and type strains. Level two contains really the majority of common pathogens. Bacteria like Campylobacter jejuni, Escherichia coli, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Staphylococcus aureus, very common opportunistic pathogens would all be considered biocontainment level two. As far as fungi go, Aspergillus fumigatus, Malassezia pachydermatis, and Candida albicans are all species that we commonly encounter in veterinary medicine that would be described as level two. Level three includes a number of really important, potentially zoonotic organisms, and fungi which cause systemic mycoses that you might encounter. So bacteria such as Bacillus anthraces, the cause of anthrax, 
Francisella tularensis, the cause of tularemia, Yersinia pestis, the agent of plague, and Brucella abortus would all be level 3 bacteria. Fungi, such as Blastomyces dermatitidis and Coccidioides imitis, are also level 3 organisms. These are all bacteria and fungi that you may in fact encounter in Western Canada. So we know that Francisella tularensis is present in our wild rodent and ligomorph populations in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, and people can become exposed on contact with either these animals or potentially the vectors that carry them as well. We'll talk more about Francisella um, in a later lecture. Similarly, Bacillus anthracis is also present in Western Canada and certainly the southwestern United States. In this image here, you can see encapsulated Bacillus anthracis, so our rod-shaped bacteria surrounded by these lucid capsules. Again, we'll talk about this more in a future lecture. This has been identified in the black-tailed uh, prairie dog ecosystem in southern Saskatchewan. Yersinia pestis is an important disease historically, so this is a, a sculpture from the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, the patron saint of plague victims. And finally, level four. These are some of the scariest pathogens which you will hopefully never encounter. Um, there are no bacteria or fungi which are categorized as level four. This is really the domain of our nasty viruses. Things like Ebola, Hendra virus, herpes B virus or simian herpes virus, Marburg virus, reconstructed uh, 1918 H1N1 influenza, and variola virus. So only the most uh, risky, threatening pathogens. A few new terms that came up today, uh, plasmids, PCR, RT-PCR, and a few questions for self-assessment. Mm -hmm.